Okay, so we have this, we need to maximize it over lambda. So how difficult can it be? We just take the first derivative and set it to zero, right? <clears throat> So we compute that derivative pretty easy to do. The, the derivative of the logarithm is one over the, the argument. So that is in here. Um, so this is the derivative. Looks pretty easy. But the, the problem is, first of all, that this thing ends up in the denominator. So this looks pretty linear, but sitting in the denominator, it's not so linear anymore. And the second problem is we have a huge amount of data. So, um, this is not just one derivative. We have like, if we have an image of 100 by 100 by 100, which for PET is a very modest, small image, we have already a, a million of these derivatives. So a million equations. And they're all equal to a summation. And that summation uh, of, over a lot of data. And in, in these uh, summations, in every term, there is this ratio with also a big summation in there. Here is summation over the image, a million again. Here is summation over the sinogram. The sinogram is typically uh, considerably larger than the image. So it's pretty impressive and it's not linear, so that's pretty inconvenient. So to make it more intimidating, I just insert this one in that one. Now it looks already more difficult. Okay, so it turns out to be not total. You cannot analytically solve this. <coughs> and therefore, we're going to use this iterative in person that I just have shown you. So now here comes a, a, a strange trick, and I'm, I've been doubting if I should explain it like this, because in the meantime, there are like, um, I think, 10 published derivations of MLAM, and some of them are more intuitive than others. And so this, this is not a derivation, this is just a recipe, and that recipe follows from a pretty complex statistical derivation uh, that was in the very first papers in 82 and 84, by Shep and Vardy and then uh, Carson. Um, <clears throat> and it, it uses expectation maximization. So we, we call the program MLAM. ML is the criterion. We say we want to go for the maximum likelihood and expectation maximization is one of many ways to reach that uh, likelihood, to, to, to obtain that maximum of the likelihood. It's a wonderful recipe and it works all the time, not only here, it, it works often. And it's an, an interesting way of approaching the problem once you are convinced that the recipe should work, but it usually it does. And so the recipe consists in introducing what is called um, a complete set of variables. If you think about PET, you could say IY is a, a non tough PET measurement. So we measure um, the total activity along a line. But you could say, what would happen if we had super tough, such that we would exactly know how many photons that we measure here are actually coming from each voxel along that line. Suppose we have measured that. Suppose we had done a super tough measure, and then we would have obtained x, y, j. And j is the voxel. And we, the, the super tough measurement would have told us, well, so many photons have been emitted in voxel J and have been detected along LORY. And, and that those photons are part of this non tough measurement that we can deduce from that. Okay? So we, we don't consider this as some variable, we consider this as a measurement. And this measurement depends on that measurement. The only difference is that we actually did this measurement and this one we did not. This is a thought experiment. All right, so because we don't actually have this value, you can wonder yeah, what to expect there. Well, if, if we have a current reconstruction image, the expectation of this is the activity that we think is in that voxel times the probability that the activity will contribute to that LOR. So, if we have a reconstruction image, we can always compute the expectation of xij. Unfortunately, we don't know xij. OK, but still, we keep on playing the game. And we say, suppose we had measured this, then we could write the, the, the likelihood uh, of obtaining this giving an image. Right? So that looks exactly the same as before. So again, you see this, this uh, logarithmic term here. Again, we have deleted the, the uh, factorial term here. Now we have, of course, a double summation. And the reason is that 
of original data were one dimensional, but these ones are two dimensional. We have to sum over them all, so we do that. And for each of those, we compute the probability of observing this if you would expect this. Okay. So if we had done the measurement, we could maximize this likelihood. Now we didn't do the measurement, so we got stuck here. And then comes the wonderful recipe. So Shep and Vardy and Carson and Large, they say, don't worry, don't worry. You can continue with this. In every iteration, you simply replace the, the this function by its expectation given the current uh, reconstruction. All right, and that uh, means that you basically replace this xij by their expectations nij. Now you could think, um, then you simply have to insert this, but that is not the case. The reason is that we actually know more. We, um, we, we not only have this, we also have the measure. And to explain that better, I will switch to my notes here. And so basically the problem looks like this. So we have um, two boxes. And one detector. And we have reason to believe that this box typically sends A bar photons um, to that detector. And this one oh, sends B photons to that detector. But during a measurement, of course, it will not be A bar, but A and here B. And then we do a measurement and we call the measurement uh, Y. So we can write the a priori expectation of A. If, if we don't have a measurement at all, we say, well, what do you expect? Well, we expect, of course, A bar by definition. And the same for B. But now we also have a measurement. And some clever person says, yeah, yeah, you claim A bar and B bar. But I noticed that we also measured A. And look, uh, Y and Y is not equal to A bar plus B bar. So this is definitely not correct. In this particular measurement, this is not what happened. So we have to do something better. So what this person wants to compute actually is the expectation of A given this particular measurement and the expectation of B given that measurement. And as you can see, this solution is not going to work anymore because it, it, it is not compatible with our knowledge of that measurement. So now you can compute that expectation. And I did that in the course. It's in, in one of the appendices. And it's, it's interesting, but you don't learn anything, in my opinion, from it. It's just mathematics. And after a lot of equations, the solution pops out. The solution is much simpler than what you obtain during the calculations, maybe because I didn't follow the right directory. The solution is um, this one corrected by your prior knowledge which is basically this. So you say, normally I would have said A bar, but since you tell me that the sum was Y and not A bar plus B bar, I will just co correct it with that same ratio. And the same is true for B. Now, of course, you see that if you add them, the sum will be Y. <laughs> So that problem is solved, but you can show that this is your best case. This is the most likely uh, value for that. So this is the expectation. So for me, that's not intuitive, which is why I did the computations. But uh, it, they show it's correct, but it's still not intuitive. OK, so I propose you believe that. Um, and if you do, then you can recognize that actually we do exactly the same thing here. We say, well, normally we would have said this. We would have taken our current reconstruction, which is called the old reconstruction here, because we're computing a new one. And we would have multiplied that with, say, with the probability of this function contributing to that measurement. And we would have said, well, that's the expectation. And we would have inserted that here. But then that clever person says, yeah, yeah, but we know that the sum of all these guys was equal to y. So we apply this correction. We say, OK, we should have we, we measured y. 
And normally we would have measured this. So here is the correction factor we need to apply. All right. So now by replacing X by its expectation based on the current measurement, we get this expression. And now we need to maximize it for lambda. It's a function of lambda here and here. And you first you simply take derivative and solve it because now, um, because we have now a double summation, if we take the derivative, we just get uh, only uh, terms depending on lambda j here that survive. And we can immediately obtain this expression. All right. And if you then insert this one in here, you get the maximum likelihood solution, which looks like this. So the thing says you take um, your current reconstruction, you forward project it to predict what you should have measured. So here I have the measured sinogram. Here I have my current prediction based on the current reconstruction. I compute the ratio. If it's one, we're good. If it's not equal to one, we should do something. And then we compute the weighted mean of all these ratios. So if on the average they tend to be higher than one, then that means that our current reconstruction is a bit small. And this weighted average of all these ratios will then be uh, larger than one, and we're going to increase our current reconstruction. Because this weighted average is simply multiplied with the current reconstruction. Okay. <clears throat> this weighted average, if you look at it, it's a back correction. So it's, it goes from a sinogram to uh, an image, and it does so by summing over all uh, sinogram values for a single voxel. And the weight is equal to how much every voxel contributes to every LOR. All right. <clears throat> now, another way to look at this and to see that at least, at least intuitively it, it is okay, you can compute the um, gradient of the likelihood, which looks like that. And then you can verify that this thing is actually a gradient ascent algorithm. So this recipe is the same as saying, I am sitting here in my old reconstruction and I want to step in the direction of the gradient of, because I want to maximize the likelihood. So I compute the gradient. So we go definitely in the, in the right direction, and this is the step size. And that step size guarantees convergence. If you do it like that, then you know um, it's going to converge to the maximum likelihood solution. Or at least every iteration, yeah, you know it's going to converge, and every iteration uh, will increase the likelihood. So it has monotonic conversions. In addition, as you notice here, everything should be positive, provided that you start with a, a positive image. And so not zero, but uh, non yeah, strictly positive. This term is positive. All the sensitivities are obviously positive too. The number of photons we measured is positive. Our scatter estimate should be a positive value or maybe zero in every voxel. Therefore, the whole thing is positive. It will never change sign. As a result, the final solution is going to be non-negative too. Because all these terms are positive, actually, the final result should be strictly positive. But in principle, if you iterate forever, a value could be decreased and converged to zero. So after infinitely many iterations, you can obtain zero. An interesting thing is that if you set an initial value to zero, it will never be, it will never change because the change is multiplicative and that zero is going to win all the time. So that is can be inconvenient, you have to be a bit careful, but it can also be convenient. If you know that some pixels are zero, an easy way to impose that in the algorithm is to simply set them to zero from the start. You have to keep in mind, if I do that, I force this pixel to be zero, even in the final solution. So you have to be a bit careful, but it can be very easy. If you set it to a negative, then the thing diverges immediately. And if you make a small programming error, such that negatives pop in in your uh, reconstruction, then MLM will immediately diverge. It, it does not survive negatives. All right, another way to explain the same thing, or, or a way to illustrate uh, more visually what happens is here. So somebody gives us a sinogram. We put that here. Somebody gives us an image. Normally, initially, it would be a uniform image. But after a while, we get an image with some uh, detail in here. We put that here. We compute the forward projection. We 
possibly also at scatter or randoms. And then we get the sinogram here too. And now pixel by pixel, we simply compute the ratio. And then we compute weighted averages of that ratio for every voxel k. So uh, this is the ratio sinogram. And then um, we compute the weighted average, which is an image for every voxel. It looks like that. And that image we, ah, sorry, that is this term. As I said, it's a weighted average. So the weights are here and we have to normalize for the sum of the weights. That's what we do here. So we take uh, a uniform sinogram and back project it, which will produce this image. So we have to divide this guy by that guy and multiply it with this one. And uh, then we will get this new result. All right, and so if you do that and you actually start from a uniform image, then you will get an ugly sinogram at the beginning. And then if you continue iterating, the images will look better and better. And your sinogram, predicted sinogram, will start getting closer and closer to the original one. But in real life, it will never become identical because this one has Poisson noise and part of that noise cannot be explained as a forward projection of something. So it's inconsistent. There is no image that can produce exactly that sinogram with noise and everything. So that means part of the noise would never make it into the image, which is good because noise is a pain. Unfortunately, a lot of noise is consistent and you can invent uh, trace distributions that also explain the noise and MLM is gonna do that. So if you iterate long enough, that noise will end up in here too. Here is the log likelihood. So you can easily compute it and it's a good idea to do it. So if you program MLM, it's definitely a good idea to compute the log likelihood and to plot it and check if it it should be monotonic. And if it's not monotonic, even a small decrease, then don't say, oh, okay, uh, it, it's almost monotonic. No, you have to look for the bug, it should increase. So one thing to, to repeat again is that the expressions look simple, but the reason is that part of the problem we simply have hidden as these sensitivity values. Because to apply the algorithm, you need to know what is the probability of every voxel to compute to every measurement? And that is true for PET and for SPECT, but the way that that contribution happens is very different to PET and SPECT. And you can push this very far and whatever you put in there, if you do it correctly in the forward and in the back projections, then the whole thing will converge and try to get a solution for your problem. So that means you could actually put a scatter in there too and reconstruct from the, the scattered photons. So recall, we have scatter, so uh, there is activity in this patient, detector sitting here. The, the photons we like are the ones that go straight into the collimator and produce this, this um, detailed image um, with some collimator blurring, of course, of the patient. And the ones we don't like are these ones, they scatter, so they produce uh, uh, seemingly activity along this line while the real, real activity is sitting there. And then this we don't like much either. This is a photon that was traveling in the right direction, but it's uh, an electron and gets uh, uh, diverged in, in another direction, um, which is a generation. But we can model all of that. And if we model it, then the algorithm will uh, invert it. And people have been trying to do that to model also the probability of the scatter to put it all in CIJ. And then you don't need to do scatter correction. You just use scatter as information. Um, and every now and then papers pop up that do that and with, with varying success. Um, my own feeling is that it's a lot of work and it's definitely scientifically interesting, but the, the, the gain in image quality you get from it is usually extremely modest. And the reason is that there is almost no information in that scatter. So the, the, the value of a scatter photon is very small because uh, the PSF associated with it or the, the positional uncertainty is very wide. So it provides very little um, spatial information. So if you compare that to an unscattered photon, then the information content of that unscattered photon for image detail is way higher and the scattered photon is almost negligible. So using those scattered photons for imaging is valid, but the gain is, is pretty small. Once we get, well, if the energy resolution of this system would get better and better and better, then it would become more and more interesting to also look at the scatter because with higher energy resolution, first thing to do is just reject the scatter. But then you could consider 
accepting more photons that have undergone a small scattering angle, for example. They will provide some more information. That scattering image would be uh, provide more high frequencies. And then you could consider using those too. But with the current systems, I'm pretty pessimistic about reconstructing from scattering. But anyway, the program would happily try to produce a solution for it. Our experience is you need to iterate forever. And so the, the richer you make your CIG, the, the larger the, the uh, condition number of your problem. So that the, the more you post your problem becomes and the longer you need to iterate. And you can imagine that if you have point spread functions like this, that it will take many, many, many iterations to decide where to put the activity associated with the block like that. Okay, so in the very beginning, when, when in the 80s, um, these algorithms were introduced, or actually more in the, in the 90s, um, <coughs> there were a lot of papers that showed images like that in presentations, and I, I did the same thing. And so then I would present to the audience saying, this is what FPP did for us, and this is what MLM can do for us with exactly the same data. And then uh, typically, uh, the presenter and the audience would agree that this image is way better than that image. But then I had a, a critical uh, medical doctor in the room and she said, well, I don't agree. I think those images are medically equivalent because the image is taken to see this here and I can see it here and I can see it here. So my diagnosis is exactly the same. So for the patient, it makes no difference if you give me this image and that image. And she was not the only one saying that. So the engineers and physicists thought, yeah, we should show that uh, these images are superior to those images and we should do that with observer studies. And then it turned out to be extremely difficult to show that this image is really better than that one. And I think the main reason is that the whole procedure has been optimized um, or was at that time optimized for image reconstruction will fit the back projection. So if you know that you're going to apply fit the back projection, you make sure you inject enough activity and you measure long enough such that your reconstruction will tell you what you need to know. And the, they're doing this all day, so they get lots of experience, so they know pretty well what to inject, how to scan, which parameters to choose such that they get to see what they want to see. And as a result, if we approve it, you still see it. You see it even better, but that doesn't count as long as you see it, the diagnosis is unchanged. So basically this algorithm is too good for this data. But of course it looks much better. So if they're equivalent, then most people will say, well, if they're equivalent, I'm still going to use this because I like it better. And my referring physicians who are less uh, familiar with nuclear medicine, they definitely see more here than there. And as I told you previously already in the meantime, we always use iterative reconstruction. These algorithms are more robust. The medical doctors have found that they actually can decrease the dose. We can make shorter scans. The PET designers have found that uh, MLM reconstruction is more forgiving than FVP, so we can have gaps in our detectors. So at this time, the, the, the additional information provided by MLM is heavily exploited. And if we now would revert back to the back direction, that would be dramatic. And the, the difference, the diagnostic the difference between these images would be uh, pretty spectacular. Because MLM is now by far the most, uh, since many years actually, by far the most popular algorithm for reconstruction in nuclear medicine, so for spectrum PET, we have to have a look at the remarkable properties of MLM to make sure that we know how to obtain good images. And so here is an important property, which is that MLM does not converge uniformly. It can converge faster in some places in the image than in the other. And here is an example to show that. So in, in this example, I've put two point sources and one is surrounded by uh, big blocks of activity, and the other one is not. And then here is a simulated PET acquisition, but it's an ideal acquisition. There is no noise, there is no scatter, there is no attenuation. So it's just line integrals basically um, through this activity. And then we will start MLM reconstruction uh, from this cyanogram. And this is what happens after a few iterations. And you see that this point is converging quickly. It's a lot hotter than that one. This one takes a lot of time to converge. 
if you draw a profile here, then you see that this one is not only higher, it's also narrower, so it's better resolution. This one has poorer resolution and a much poorer uh, recovery coefficient. But if we continue iterating, then it will go better and better. And uh, this is, I think, after 100 iterations. Yeah. I'm sure I can read the number of iterations here. But anyway, you see the progress. So this is the number of iterations, and this is the evolution of the two point sources. And you see that this one quickly goes up and reaches converges after uh, like 100 iterations, while this one does not. And the only difference between the two is this surrounding activity. So why is this happening? Well, you could say that the likelihood is more sensitive to that point source than to this point source. And in a way you can see that in the sinogram. So this point source projects here. And you see it's almost everywhere nice low, nicely isolated. So it's, it sticks out from the background very clearly. And to maximize the likelihood, it, the, the program needs to invent an image that is such that if you forward project it, you get exactly the same sign. Around. So the algorithm doesn't have too much choice. A point source should be here. For the other point source, the situation is very different. So most of its projections are covered by these surrounding activities. And that means that at, during the iterations, the algorithm cannot immediately be sure where to put the activity. It could be that there is some non-uniformity in these big blobs. And if that would be the case, then the reconstruction of that point source would be different. So you could argue that in this case, the algorithm has more reconstruction work to do. It needs to figure out where exactly to put all that activity. And that point source cannot really converge very well unless the surrounding activity has also converged. So there's more work to do here. Um, or stated otherwise, the uh, derivatives of the likelihood to activity in these point sources is different for this point source than for that point source, much larger here. So uh, all, all different ways to say that the data provide actually more information about this point source than about that point source, resulting in faster convergence. So from this, we learn that if we want um, quantitative images, it seems that we're gonna have to iterate very long. All right, so here is another example. Um, in this case, the, the object is a radioactive disk. So again, it's just a 2D simulation. And inside that disk, there is a radioactive ring. And in this case, I've taken into account attenuation. And you can see that. So a projection going through this side here, through the part of the ring here, goes here. And there you can see that the ring contributes significantly to the sinogram data here. And that is because the attenuation along these LORs is relatively small. If you consider an LOR here going through the center of the disk, then due to attenuation, the activity of the disk um, is strongly attenuated, so it contributes much less to the sinogram. So if we start iterating, then again, we see the same effect because this part of the ring contributed more to the data. It also converges faster. And in early iterations, we see that there is very non-uniform convergence. And so if you want quantification and you want to know if this ring is uniform or not, then you can clearly not stop after eight iterations. If you do 100 iterations, you get a pretty nice image. And with the back projection, no iterations at all, 200 times faster than this. And in one go, you got about the same image. However, we can put noise on the sinogram, so I added Poisson noise to it. And if we now do the reconstructions, then you see that after eight iterations, the image is, of course, still not uniform, but the noise is not too bad. After 100 iterations, the noise is pretty disturbing. And uh, with the back projection, the noise looks even worse as we know the back projection is not so good in handling the noise. So, we could stop iterating here, but then we don't have uniform converges, but we have lower noise. If we want have quantification, it's better to iterate longer, but then we get too much noise. And that is the reason to post smooth the image. We post smooth the image the same everywhere. So as a result, we have now poorer resolution, but at least the poor resolution is the same everywhere. And so that it affects the ring uh, the same everywhere. And as a result, the ring is still uniform. 
And you see also that even with post smoothing, the noise in the filter back to HCD, which is still a bit worse because um, the noise here was, of course, much higher. Yeah, I got a question. How did you how did you do attenuation correction in filter back projection? Be correcting for attenuation and then back projecting. So basically, you divided the program by the attenuation factors. Yes, and so if you analyze this very carefully, you should see that there is more noise in the center than uh, near the edges, and that the noise, especially in the center, will be higher for FVP than for uh, a median. It's not too bad here because this object is circularly symmetrical, and um, FVP as Discuss that also later is a good approximator of unweighted least squares. MLM is a good approximation of a weighted least squares algorithm, but in the center of the object, the weights are the same everywhere. So it doesn't really matter too much if you model the Poisson noise correctly because the uncertainty of the data is the same. But if you go off center, then it starts mattering because there are data that are a better certainty than the others, and you should rely more on the data that have better accuracy. And FVP doesn't, it takes all the data with the same way. So if you want to see the difference between FVP and MLM, better make a very asymmetrical object, then you should see it better. Another reason why we have all these streaks, well, there's two other reasons, is that uh, FVP is sensitive to the sampling in the cyanogram. So if you have uh, more cyanogram rows, then this streaking will be slightly less disturbing. And second, FVP can go negative. So it can put uh, an average of zero activity in the background and doing that by putting as many positives as negatives. And as a result, you get positive and negative streaks, but if you look along the projection lines, they will cancel. MLM cannot do that because we, it has a non-negativity constraint. It cannot go negative. So the only way for MLM to make a zero background is to really make a nice, clean zero background. So the background in MLM always looks much better than the background in filter back correction. And so if you take a quick look, then you will immediately say, oh, this image is nicer than that one. But of course, the medical doctors don't look in the background. They look in the center. So that is the part that matters. We can ignore this background. So the difference between the two is less dramatic than you would think at first sight. All right. Now, there's a lot of papers about what happens if you iterate very long, and they call it noise deterioration, or that the image is, is uh, diverging or whatever. But actually, it, it's not diverging. It, it, the likelihood is still increasing. And here is that illustrated um, with the cardiac scan, so a scan with low activity and uh, with, with low, uh, uh, relatively small number of counts. And this reconstructed will fit the back correction. And, this one is very asymmetrical. And as a result of all that noise and the asymmetry for the back projection starts to produce these streaks. And in, the streaks tend to be horizontal. And the reason is that the horizontal LORs provide the least reliable information. And for the back projection relies too heavily on those. So due to noise, they will have over and under estimations. And in the back projection, that creates positive and negative streaks. MLM is not doing that. It's better taken into account the relative certainty of these LORs, so it doesn't produce these streaks. But if you iterate very long, it gets noisier and noisier. And I've overdone it a bit after a thousand iterations to get what looks like a pretty ugly image. However, if you post smooth it, it looks a lot better again. And that makes sense because this image has very high likelihood. The only problem is that uh, we did no resolution modeling here. So the, 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 the algorithm has plenty of opportunities to incorporate noise from the cyanogram into the image. So it explains a lot of the noise that was observed in the cyanogram by making an extremely noisy image. That improves the likelihood because the likelihood is the highest if the forward projected cyanogram is identical to the measured cyanogram. So if the algorithm manages to also explain the noise, the likelihood will go up. Okay, so but this image is not as bad as is often published. If you post smooth it, you actually get a pretty good image. Okay, now MLM was um, published in uh, 82 and 84. But at that time, the computers were not strong enough to use it. And so it, it 
people kept on using filter back correction until in, in 94, I think. Um, the ordered sub subsets approach uh, was proposed, which in retrospect is actually very simple. And since then, the method has been quickly adopted and introduced in clinical practice. So here are a few slides to explain the idea of ordered subsets and give you an intuitive feeling as to why it actually works. So here is again a very simple two-day example. So I took a, a Shep Logan-like image for what projected it. And now I just make the back correction images of um, subsets of this sinogram. And here I just took the first row and the middle row. So zero degrees and 90 degrees. And I applied filter back correction to see if something would come out. And as you see, nothing much comes out. You can guess that the, the, the object must be in the center here, but that's about it. But if you add a few lines, then you pretty quickly, you start seeing already the image. So here, you actually get a surprisingly good image from just eight projections and that with an algorithm that's definitely not designed to do that. So there is a lot of information in uh, a few projections, which are nicely spread out over the sign. And if I add more and more, so the, the original sinogram was 200, then you see that from the subsets, we actually obtain already a lot of information. And so based on that idea, the order subsets uh, method was proposed, but it was also uh, a bit theoretically justified. Um, <clears throat> and so here it is demonstrated. So we're going to do one iteration of 40 subsets and we take two corrections per subset. It worked here because everything is ideal. In the paper, in the ordered subsets paper, they actually say you shouldn't use two corrections, you should at least use four corrections per subset. But in these ideal cases, even two corrections work. And it's easier to follow what happens with two corrections per subset. So we start with uniform image, as you know, in MLM, you should never start with a zero image because then nothing is going to happen because it's in a duplicative algorithm. So we said once in the entire field of view, and here we don't put once because this, this would be outside the pet system. And then we forward project this uniform image. We compare that to the sinogram, but we only for, forward project it along two perpendicular uh, LORs. We do the sinogram comparison to the back correction, multiply that with the original uniform image, and this is what we get. And then we do the same, but now along two different LORs. So these two, again, forward correction, just two corrections, that's going to be very fast. Sinogram calculation, back correction, multiplication of the image. And we keep on doing that, and each time we take two orthogonal corrections, which are as far as possible from the ones we have already used. If you do that, then by the time you have done uh, every, you have used every projection exactly once. So for every projection, you have computed the four projection, made the division, and computed back projection. Then you get already an excellent uh, reconstruction. And so here is the comparison then. So um, here at the bottom are the MLM iterations. And so for the same object here, is a 360 degrees acquisition. We did 40 iterations, and in every iteration, all projections were used. And on the top, we only did one awesome iteration with 40 subsets. So that means here, every for MLM, every sinogram row has been forward and back projected 40 times. And in the awesome approach, only once. So this thing is about 40 times faster than MLM. And you see at the end, you actually get the same image. And so the method is very simple to program. If you already have an MLM implementation, making OSM is straightforward. And actually all OSM needs is back correction and forward correction. So at the time this was published, everyone had already a back correction because of filtered back correction uh, implementations. So all you need to do is to make a matched forward projection. The rest is extremely simple. Convergence is guaranteed. And adding subsets to it is pretty trivial. So the algorithm got quickly adopted. And since then, it started quickly becoming the dominating reconstruction algorithm. So in just a few years, it basically replaced filter back projection, at least 2D versions of that. So in, in, the, in the awesome paper also, they point out that in the ideal case, 
and the ideal case in, in that in combination, I should have checked exactly what it means, uh, the subset balance. I think it means that all subsets have seen exactly the same amount of activity or, or counts. So in that case, then convergence is guaranteed. But the conditions for guaranteed convergence are never met in practice because one condition is that the sinogram should be consistent and due to noise, they're never consistent. So if the sinogram is not consistent, then you get a small conflict between the different subsets and you don't get uh, converges to the maximum likelihood solution. And that is illustrated here. So you have to use your fantasy a bit because now this two dimensional slide is actually the uh, space of all possible images. So it has as many dimensions as pixels in the image, right? And in such a space, a pixel is just a point because a point fixes the value of every pixel of every voxel, if you want, of the image. And so suppose the uniform image is sitting here. So this point means all uh, values in the field of view are set to one. And suppose that the maximum likelihood is sitting here. Now in the ideal case, so with that subset balance and no noise, um, the subsets uh, have solutions like this. And they have a, a common solution, which is the maximum likelihood uh, solution. So the reason that these subsets don't have a single solution is that we don't have enough corrections. So the, the system is underdetermined. We have far fewer equations than unknowns. And that means that there is a null space and that uh, there are many solutions. You can invent many images that will uh, produce, if you forward correct them, the, the values seen in the subset corrections. So they have many solutions, but um, one of them, of course, is the true ML solution because everything is ideal. And all the subsets agree on that solution, and all of them have a lot of other solutions. So what happens if you iterate there, then uh, after a while, every subset will start pushing uh, the, the image to its own solution. And because they all get their chance to push a bit, the, the uh, program the, or the, the algorithm will converge to the common solution. But if there is noise or any other source of inconsistency, which could be that there is scatter and you don't correct for it, or that uh, you don't model the attenuation correctly, or, or for, and, and those conditions are always present in practice, then these subsets actually do not have a, a common solution. Um, there may be one or, or many images that maximize the likelihood for a particular subset, but they, they will all be different. And as a result, initially, the conversions will be very similar to what you see here, because the solution is far away and they all agree that we should go in that direction. But once you get very close to the true maximum likelihood solution, the subsets heavily disagree on where to go. And now with every iteration, they will push the image toward their own set of solutions, but because they have nothing in common, they will keep on fighting forever. And so if you keep on iterating, then you will start uh, end up in, in what is called a limit cycle. So the, the solution will always be pushed around by every subset in a different direction. You will stay close to the maximum likelihood solution in some sense, but you will never reach it. So, that was, of course, uh, a matter of concern. And so many solutions have been uh, investigated. Um, so the, yeah, the, there was many uh, modifications to the OSM algorithm to obtain converging uh, iterative algorithms. And they're called uh, converging block iterative algorithms, where the block denotes a subset. But it turns out that all these algorithms are a bit slower than OSM. So the way that they achieve um, convergence always uh, is by sacrificing speed. Now, if you have to sacrifice speed anyway, then a, a modern and simpler solution is to decrease the number of subsets. Because initially, as you can see, the, the, the both algorithms, uh, MLM and, and, um, and ordered subsets, they will all go in the same direction. So initially, when you start, you can afford to use a lot of subsets. But once you get close to the solution, you should decrease the number of subsets. And the fewer subsets you're going to use, the smaller that limit cycle is going to be. And in the limit, if you just have one subset containing operations, 
you will get conversions. So you could gradually decrease the number of subsets, but that means that as the number of subsets gets smaller, you have more work per subset and um, the conversions will slow down. And the third solution is to simply ignore the problem. Say, okay, it doesn't converge, but as, as I've shown, if you go to conversions, you get a horribly noisy image anyway, nobody likes it. So the idea is, well, actually we don't care about conversions because we are not interested in the converged MLM uh, solution. And of course, ignoring the problem is by far the simplest solution. And uh, as a result, it's also the most popular solution. And so that means that almost all vendors of gamma cameras and pit cameras uh, propose to use this solution and that's what they offer uh, in, in their system. So here, uh, <coughs> again, a, a simplistic um, 2D simulation to illustrate this. So here is the true image. And here I have um, done 64 MLM iterations with one subset. So using all uh, the entire cyanogram in every iteration. And here I've done one iteration with 64 subsets. So again, this one was 64 times faster than this one. It's approximately 60 times 64. It's a bit less than 64 because after every projection and back projection, you need to multiply the image. And uh, so this one uh, has to do as many image multiplications as, as that one. So that image multiplication is not excellent. All right, and if you now compute the difference between the two, you see noise. And if you then start carefully analyzing these two, then you will see that the noise in this one is a bit higher. Like here is a, is a pretty hot spot, which is less hot here. And if you look through it, then you will see this one is actually closer to the true solution. I could have computed the, the, the sum of square differences. It would be smaller for the MLM solution than for the Boston solution. But you could argue both images are pretty ugly. The first thing we're going to do is to post smooth them. And if you post smooth them, the difference will be smaller because this noise is high frequent noise and a bit of smoothing dramatically suppresses it. So the difference will be small and in many cases not clinically uh, relevant. <coughs> 